So let's let's get started. So for our third talk of the morning, we're very happy to have Stefanos Aratakis from uh, Toronto, who will be telling us about observational signatures from extremal black holes. Stefanos, please. Thank you very much, Martin, for the invitation and the introduction. It's my great pleasure to give this talk. Um, okay, I would like to talk about observation signatures for extremal black holes, which is um, the, one of the main things I've been studying for some time now. So let me explain what uh, the main question is. Uh, what do I mean by an observation signature for extremal black holes? What I really mean is we would like to know if there is a distinguishing feature in the dynamics of the perturbations in the dynamics of extremal black holes that uh, you know, differentiates extremal black holes from non-extremal black holes. So it's a question about whether extremal black holes have um, different behavior and more specifically, uh, if that behavior can be, if that different behavior can be observed um, from regions outside the black hole, and uh, if possible, can be observed from uh, far from the black hole, specifically uh, from null infinity. So we are looking for signs in the dynamics of extrema black holes that uh, differentiate them from uh, sub extrema black holes and can be measured, can be observed. Uh, from null infinity. Um, the dynamics we are going to study in this uh, lecture will be the possible, the simplest possible uh, problem, namely that of um, the dynamics um, of the scalar linear wave, homogeneous wave equation. <clears throat> okay, and we, we are going to study this equation here, and we're going to see the difference between the evolution of solutions to such equation on sub-extremal background and on extremal backgrounds. And we're going to see whether that difference is an effect that can be observed indeed by, say, observers on null infinity, and in what sense this can be done. But uh, once again, everything I will talk about is at the level of this equation here. <clears throat> The reason we study this equation, the wave equation, is because we hope that the, whatever we see uh, for this equation um, has some um, analog in the actual you know, equations of linearized gravity or the fully nonlinear uh, equations. Okay, so the first problem we would like to study, like the actual problem we would study at the end, is you know, the evolution of the linear wave equation on the exterior of black hole backgrounds. And mainly we will consider these uh, families, okay, the Kerr and the Ryzen also family. We prescribe initial data on initial hypersurface that um, um, intersects the event horizon and okay, reaches null infinity. So we prescribe initial data here and we want to see how the um, solutions to such an equation uh, behave towards the future. And specifically, we want to know their behavior along now, uh, along the event horizon, uh, along time like geodesics, and also along the null generators of null infinity. So, along null infinity. So, we really want globally to understand the behavior of the wave equation in the exterior. And, <clears throat> and again, one of the reasons one would like to understand this equation is because the Einstein equations in a specific gauge take such a form, okay, the quasi-linear wave question system. All right. <clears throat> um, my ultimate goal is, as especially for this talk today, is to obtain observational signatures of extremality. But meanwhile, we are going to uh, um, study the asymptotics, okay, of the wave question. In time, and these asymptotics will be used will be useful also for other considerations such as stability considerations in the outside, and also for studying um, uh, the strong cosmic censorship in the interior. So, although my focus will be on observational features, um, the analysis is also useful for stability problems, but maybe also for you know 
problems related to the formation of similarities. Okay, let's see a little bit more specifically what we will be doing. We will be considering initial uh, data, uh, which uh, will be supported near the event horizon. So such data here, the red is the support of the initial data. So such data will be um, local perturbations of the event horizon. Um, and uh, we will try to see what kind of information they register on all infinity. Okay. Now, uh, since these data are somehow locally around, like they are local uh, data around the event horizon, that means that you know, in order to see what um, we can measure from null infinity, we certainly need to understand what happens at late times along null infinity. Okay, so just intermediate times would not be enough. Precisely because we're trying to see something that happens close to the black hole, right? So that in order for that thing to radiate, we really need to go uh, at late times to null infinity. So that picture here suggests that we need to study this region here if we want to understand things on null infinity. So ideally, we would derive precise late time asymptotics for our perturbations um, and their radiation field, right, on null infinity. So when I say precise late time asymptotics, I mean that we actually need to go beyond um, uh, the standard quasi-normal modes, and we actually need to study power law phase. Okay. Now, why do I care about observational signs of extremality? Well, there is some interest in this category of black holes. The interest is also theoretical, but also practical. Theoretically, they have uh, they, such black holes saturate geometric inequalities. They have applications in high energy physics, and also in uh, they also appear in various turbulent gravitational uh, phenomena. Now, from a slightly more practical point of view, whatever that means, um, there is a large um, astronomical literature, you know, studying such black holes and. Um, Various papers suggest that um, near extrema black holes might be uh, ubiquitous actually in the universe. Okay. So, <clears throat> in the next three or four slides, I will uh, immediately present the result. And by that, I mean I will present precisely which quantities we call signatures, okay? And they have the potential of serving as observational signatures of extrema black holes. So I'm going to show you the specific quantities that differentiate extremality from sub-extremality. Uh, all these quantities are about null infinity. So these are things really that can't be measured on null infinity. And then after I present the, the main results, I will um, try to go back to the beginning and explain the analysis behind the questions, more results, and also the more physic the physical meaning of such quantities. Okay, <clears throat> so for now you will just see bland, you know, quantities. All right, so at null infinity, we will define. Um, the, we have the radiation field, R, R C, uh, at every point on, on all infinity. So tau is the time coordinate on all infinity, and theta is the angle of uh, the null generator on all infinity. So this is a full coordinate system on all infinity. If we fix theta, then we are fixing the null generator. And if we let tau go to infinity, then um, we are just looking at the limit of the radiation field along null infinity. The limit of the radiation field along null infinity uh, is zero. In fact, this thing decays like one over t to the two. So if we multiply this by t to the two, we expect to get something finite and non-trivial, non-zero. So this limit, this scale limit of the radiation field is what we call S0 of C. And uh, that limit depends, uh, like in the way at least it's measured, it depends on what null generator we consider. For every null generator, we consider the limit of the scaled limit, the rescale limit of the um, radiation field restricted on all the, that null generator, and we have that quantity here. By the way, everything I am saying for now 
and that I wanted to say, everything I'm saying for now, um, holds for um, for the Rise and Nordstrom family. Okay, the Rise and Nordstrom consists of the sub-extremal Rise and Nordstrom and the extremal Rise and Nordstrom. So I know a priori that C is a solution to the wave equation on a Rise and Nordstrom space-time, and I want to know what are the different features of C if C is a solution on the extremal Rise and Nordstrom compared to the case where C uh, would be a solution to the sub uh, on the sub-extremal Rise and Nordstrom space time. So for sure, we know that C is a, sol is a, is on a, is a solution, is a better person on uh, Rise and Nordstrom background. Okay. And we're trying to find difference between the extremal and sub-extremal case. Okay, so the first result, which is what I said, is that you know this this quantity here is finite. This is just because of the nature of the decay rate of the radiation field, and also that in fact this limit does not depend on which angle you are on on al infinity. Okay, so this limit here is actually dominated by the spherical mean of psi, which means that um, the, it's in the, like you you don't. Uh, yeah, the, the, this S0 of C is independent of theta. Okay, so it doesn't matter whether you are measuring S0 from this generator or this generator or this generator, it's always the same line. Now, I'm going to insist a little bit, um, quite a bit, on you know, uh, measuring things not just on null, on null infinity, but also on specific null generators. Because, okay, what we want to assume is that we are ideally very far um, away observers from the black holes and we are receiving radiation. So we place ourselves on null infinity, but we cannot place ourselves on the whole null infinity, right? We can only place ourselves on a null generator of, of null infinity. So I want the things that can be measured by null, from null infinity that I want to guarantee that they can only be measured on a fixed null generator of null infinity. And that's why I will just pay attention to that. So this thing here depends, it can indeed be measured by, by on, a fi, on a fixed generator of null infinity, okay? It's just that as a result, its, um, uh, its value does not depend at the end of the day, which generator you use to compute it. Okay, so that was S0. Now we defined the first signature S1. S0 was more like an auxiliary quantity. So S1 is the first main quantity, uh, which is this one here. So let's see what it is. M is the mass parameter of the rise in Austrian family. The charge is not seen here, which is very good because that means that we don't need to know the charge of the rise in Austrian family. So in particular, we can define this quantity without knowing whether uh, we are on extremal or sub-extremal background because precisely we don't need to know the charge to define this, only the mass. And let's see what we need to know. Uh, again, we have the radiation field on null infinity on some angle. We have the, 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 the factor here. We have the limit. So this is precisely the S0, okay, multiplied by the mass. Perfect. And now this is uh, this number here times the integral of the radiation field over the whole null infinity, okay, like to the future of our initial hy null hypersurface. So we see that in order to define S0, we need to integrate the radiation field, So, which means we need to know the radiation field uh, along the null generators, right? But for all null generators. So we're integrating in angles. So in order to compute S1, unfortunately, not only we need to know the radiation field along one generator, which is what happens here, but we also need to know the radiation field along all null generators of null infinity. Nonetheless, this only depends on the radiation field on null infinity. Uh, okay, so let's see what kind of results we have for this one that can be measured from null infinity. Uh, for both rise and for both sub-extremal and extremal rise and Nordstrom, this quantity is finite. Okay. Uh, and it's also independent of theta. Well, this is clearly independent of theta. It's just a number. Um, this is just the whole integral. We integrate over all angles. And this is the result that we said before, that this is independent of theta. 
So both of them are independent of theta, so that immediately follows. But as we said, knowing this requires integrate over all angles. Again, I am assuming that Psi is a solution to the wave equation on a rise in Nordstrom space time. Okay. Gotcha. And here are now, here is the first main result. So, in collaboration with Yanis Angelopoulos from um, Caltech and Day and Guides, um, we have shown the following result. Um, for all scalar perturbations on sub-extremal rise in Nordstrom, okay. The first uh, signature is necessarily zero. So this quantity here has to be zero for all scalar perturbations, for all solutions to the wave equation on a sub-extremal rise in Austin background. Okay, this has to be zero. It always has to be finite, okay, regardless of whether you are sub-extremal or extremal background. And so if uh, Stefano, yes, this does not depend on the uh, initial data. Sorry, it, it, it depends it, on the initial data. It depends, uh, uh, I mean, some completely. decay conditions on the initial data, at least, right? Yes, yes, perfect. Exactly. So, so let me go back. Yeah. So, as I said, I'm assuming that the initial data are actually even localized cl um, close to the event horizon. So, compact okay. supported initial data. I, we don't have to assume that they're compactly supported, right? We can assume that they, they appropriately decay and the decay is natural. But um, yeah, for for now we can just assume that they we have okay. smooth compactly supporting this data supporting supported close to the event horizon. Okay, but we don't have to do this assumption. Right? They don't have to be compact supported. Just no, I understand. But you need some decay. I think. Yes, yes, yes. Perfect. So this quantity here does depend on the initial data. It depends on C for sure, but it just doesn't depend on the angle. It's just a number. Um, yeah, that's independent of the angle. Mm, all right. So this quantity for all sub extrema black holes will be zero. And if it turns out that we have a psi for which this quantity is non zero, then we can immediately conclude that it cannot be a sub extrema black hole. So it must be a sub, it, it must be an extrema black hole if that happens. And indeed, for generic perturbations of extremal rise in Nordstrom, we do have that this quantity is non-zero. Okay. So if this quantity is non-zero, then the black hole on which C uh, evolves is an extremal rise in Nordstrom. So you see, we have a quantity that we can define for all solutions to the wave equation on a rise in Nordstrom space time. We don't need to know, we only need to know the mass, we don't need to know the charge. Uh, we only need to know the radiation field on all infinity, but all of it in all, at all angles. And based on such a measurement, we can, and based on the behavior of the dynamics, right, of uh, such a C, so based on such a measurement of the dynamics, we can conclude backwards what happens with the geometry. And in particular, we can conclude whether it's uh, extremal or sub-extremal, at least generically. Now, one of the issues, um, about such a signature, as we said, is that, okay, it is theoretically nice to have something that differentiates extremality from some extremality, but it doesn't have uh, practical applications, whatever practical means, in the sense that, you know, uh, it, it wouldn't be reasonable to expect that we can measure the radiation field over all angles, okay, because we want to assume we are living along a uh, an uh, on a specific angle, we are on a on a specific null generator of null infinity. So this can be computed by null infinity, but it cannot be computed uh, by only one null generator of null infinity. Okay, like it cannot be computed from a null generator of null infinity. And that's the second uh, signature I would like to present, um, which can indeed be entirely computed by only knowing the radiation field on a fixed null generator of null infinity, say our null generator. So you see, let, let's see what the signature is. So this is two that is computed on a specific angle of null infinity. So what is it? It's minus one over two times the S0 quantity that I told you before that requires knowing the radiation field on a specific angle, okay? Times again, a limit, various rescalings here. 
T to the 3 log T, the radiation field at the angle theta minus again the S0 times tau over log T. So by basically using logarithmic corrections, I probably can explain later, uh, we can find a different signature, right? Which can be entirely computed uh, by only knowing the radiation field on a fixed angle. Okay, this is S0 I talked about before, and this radiation field itself um, on the fixed angle, and just taking limits with appropriate scale um, factors of it. Okay, so what do we have? Um, again, with in collaboration with Yanis and Dayan, we've shown that for all scalar perturbations uh, on sub-extremal backgrounds, we have that this signature as the, sorry, this quantity is always one. On the other hand, with collaboration in collaboration with Kana and Samparval, we've shown that for generic perturbations of extremal resin Nordstrom, this quantity is generically not one. And again, this is a quantity that can be computed from a fixed generator of nothing. So if we're on that generator and we have access to the radiation field along that generator, we can compute this quantity, which of course involves knowing late, late time what's happening because we have limits, right? And if we get that the answer is known to one, then we can conclude that the space-time itself is extremal. Okay, uh, now these results, uh, are based on rigorous estimates, uh, but this one here also makes use of uh, some estimates that uh, have been obtained based on numerical simulations. Okay, say this. This one is 100% rigorous. Okay, so basically that's the main result of uh, the lecture. Now I want to go back somehow from the beginning and um, I'd like to present what is the physical meaning like i want to present more about the analysis of hi, the wave hi stephanos so uh, the, the the use of computer simulations is just because it's not easy to describe actual data for which this is not one like analytically and uh, not exactly um it's it, it's not really about the initial data it's about um uh, bound, it, it's really about obtaining estimates and bounding um, the norms of operators in time Oh, so okay. yeah, yeah. It's, it's not like yeah, it's not really about things. But, uh, um, so some of the heavy analysis is um, not done that should have been done, but instead it's left to a numerical simulation. Okay. Mm, yeah. Okay. So as I said, I will also try now to explain a little bit more about the analysis of uh, the wave question plus also provide some uh, physical interpretation of the S1 and S2 signature. Okay, so the previous results, as I said, rely on precise late time asymptotics for scalar perturbations. After all, it's all about taking limits of the radiation field on an infinity. So we need to present, we need to derive the precise late asymptotics. How do we do that? Okay, we need to start from somewhere. Uh, the starting point would be Nikovsky, right? Where we know, especially that if we consider compactly supported initial data, so the support here is like the data is here is zero, we know that we have strong Huggins principle, so we know that um, the asymptotics are trivial. Uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, we would like to know why the asymptotics are trivial. So let's see if we can learn something from Nikovsky that we can apply to the case of black holes. Right. Although the radiation field here is trivial, let's see why if we can learn something out of it from the case of Mikos. Uh, if Mikos is very symmetric, we can restrict to specific like fixed angular frequencies. The wave equation looks like that. V is the outgoing derivative, dv, and du is the incoming derivative. Now, the wave equation is exactly this. The du derivative of a quantity is zero. That means this quantity is conserved in the u direction, which means in this direction. So this quantity is conserved, perfect. Now, since we consider the initial data here is um, trivial, the conservation law tells us that they are trivial, like this quantity is trivial all the way up to here, the axis. 
And the conservation law allows us to cross this wave zone where we expect things not to be trivial. So I don't have to worry at all about what's happening here because the conservation law, right, in the U direction, allows me to cross this. And I can enter this region uh, without any issue. In particular, we can go here. Um, uh, and this whole region, yeah, uh, the, um, the, this derivative is zero. Now, if you integrate in this direction, you're integrating that derivative, which is zero here. The starting point is zero because the starting point R is zero here. There is an R factor here, so it's zero here. The, the DV derivative is zero because it's conserved and it was zero here. So you integrate in this direction, you get that everything is zero here. Okay, initially it's zero, the derivative is zero due to the conservation, so everything is zero here. And that's the result. So what was the magic ingredient in proving here the strong continuous principle of Mikovsky? It was precisely that the derivative here, the outgoing derivative here is zero. And we were able to prove that based on the fact that it's zero here, okay, by crossing the wave zone without any issues. And that crossing was allowed due to the conservation of these derivatives. Okay, the value here is the same as the value here. So it's a conservation law at the end of the day that allow us to, to do it, okay, in the, in, in, in the null direction, in the incoming direction. So what I would like to convince you is that uh, similar conservation laws are responsible for even the non-trivial asymptotics of the wave equation on black hole backgrounds, okay? And actually, let me present that conservation law. Um, uh, for say this is Schwarzschild or Ryzen Nordstrom space time. Um, we definitely don't have a conservation law along any incoming null geodesic, for sure. But what we have is the, um, an asymptotic conservation law along null infinity. Okay, so null infinity is an ideal, you know, incoming null uh, hypersurface. So what we do is we consider the outgoing derivative at null infinity, appropriately rescaled so that we get something that it's non-zero, uh, but finite. And what we see is that this expression at null infinity is indeed conserved uh, along null infinity. So what, whatever we used here to cross the wave zone without issues, we can now use in the case of black holes only on null infinity. All right, so that expression gives us what we call the Newman Penrose constant. Now, um, if you remember, as we said with Sergio, uh, we are going to consider, um, a, say, perturbations which are compactly supported. So, in particular, at null infinity for some time, these perturbations are completely zero, which means that our perturbations. Uh, have the property that these derivatives for some time will be zero. So this conservation simply tells us that the, um, they will be zero for all times. So, okay, it's a useful conservation law. Uh, something that is initially zero stays zero due to the initial compact support of initial data. But it's not useful for deriving asymptotics of um, the radiation field, say because we don't expect the radiation field to be compactly supported in time as it was for the Mikowski case, right? So having that something is, having that zero is conserved is useful in, the, in this case because we want to prove that something is zero. But having that zero is conserved in this case is not useful because we don't want to get zero for late times, right? We want to get asymptotics, which are not zero. And we'll see what it is, but it's not zero. So this conservation law, which is just the limit of the Mikowski conservation law on infinity is not super useful as it is. What makes it super useful is when we consider the precise conservation law, not for Psi itself, but for Psi after removing one uh, time derivative. Not after adding, but after removing one time derivative, okay? So this thing here can be well-defined um, the time that it's, it's also a solution to the wave equation that has a property that its time derivative is the original C. Uh, this thing does not have to be any more compactly supported. Okay, so the corresponding conservation law on infinity uh, makes sense. And 
it's finite and it's generically non-zero. So it's this non-zero, non-trivial conserved quantity associated to this thing and hence to Psi itself that dominates the asymptotics eventually. Okay, so it is conservation law that gives us the non-trivial asymptotics, but via this time integral of Psi. So we are going to see how this appears in the asymptotics of Psi in a second. For now, I just wanted to present the, the conservation law we are considering. Now, a few other things that are different in the case of black holes compared to the case of uh, Mikowski that I presented earlier is, of course, the presence of the redshift effect uh, along the event horizon that we've heard in several talks. Um, the issue of having positive mass at infinity and the issue of having a photon sphere uh, outside the black hole right, where trapped null geodesics uh, exist. There has been huge literature on the problem of dynamics of black holes uh, for all kinds of fields. Um, in this talk, I'm only restricting the wave question. And for this reason, I am um, uh, picking just the result of Mikhail Yakov and Igor. Uh, who have shown that, you know, for rise and awesome and for, for sub-exemal rise and awesome, sub care, you have indeed decay of all the quantities. Okay, so we have decay for the sub case. Now, let me present the precise asymptotics. Um, I'll start with the Schwarz case. Uh, at the event horizon, uh, these are the asymptotics. It's, uh, this is a precise asymptotic. Okay? This is the leading order term. Uh, in the time expansion along um, uh, the event horizon. So Psi behaves like one over T to the three times this factor, plus a term that, that decays faster than this one. And this is exactly the conservation law that I presented earlier. So you see it's this conserved quantity that dominates the leading order asymptotic of Psi. Away from the event horizon, along constant radius hypersurface surface is exactly the same asymptotic. Again, this quantity provides the asymptotic expression. And along null infinity, we have the same quantity at the, the top order term and the same quantity at the next order term, which is a logarithmic correction. It's uh, like the top order term is t to the minus three for the radiation field. And the next term is not two to the minus three. It's log t times t to the minus three. Okay? It's a little bit worse than t to the minus three. But in all cases, we see that uh, no matter where we are, it's this expression here that um, appears in the asymptotics. This expression here is generically non-zero. Uh, we see here the correlation among the asymptotics. Uh, this work uh, recovers semi-analytical work of liver and also exactly the same results have been independently obtained by Peter. Yes. Okay, that was for Schwarzschild. What if we turn now the charge? on, oh, oh, not yet. All right, so actually uh, I wanted to talk about uh, Ryzen also, but um, maybe we can stick with Schwarzschild. Okay, these are the asymptotics. Um, um, as I said, I gave you the physical meaning of this constant here that appears in the asymptotics, but what if we want to compute it so that, for example, we can be convinced that generically this is non zero for initial data, right, for generic initial data. Well, here is the computation. In terms of the initial data, um, it's the integral of C on the bifurcate sphere, okay? Plus the integral of the initial sphere of the time derivative of C with appropriate factors. So this expression here is finite and uh, generically non-zero. Moreover, we can compute the same factor in terms of the radiation field which is precisely this integral. It's the integral of the radiation field to the future of our initial hypersurface over the whole um, angles, okay? Over all angles and all times. So it's a full flux of the radiation field on null infinity. That's what it is. And we see that this integral is what dominates the asymptotics everywhere, even at the event horizon. And that is in agreement with the expectation that the weak field dynamics, that is to say, knowing the radiation field at null infinity, is what dictates the late time tails, like the, the late time dynamics. 
So it's the weak field dynamics that just field that dictates uh, the asymptotics everywhere in space time. That was the expectation. And that's exactly what happens for, say, that, the spots in space time. Uh, ah, okay, here we have the um, um, case where we project C on individual angular frequencies. We can improve the asymptotics so that they depend on the specific frequency we are um, supported on. Um, and in this way, we can recover the, what is known as Price's law. Um, <clears throat> again, the, the main coefficient is this one here, and that also uh, relies on specific conservation laws in the sense we discussed before. Okay, so let me go back to the general asymptotics for C on Schwarzschild. Uh, this is what we've already seen. And I think now it's time to turn the charge on so that we enter the Ryzen Nordstrom family. And indeed, um, if we consider now C a solution to the sub-extremal Ryzen Nordstrom, then we get these asymptotics. Now, if we observe a little bit more closely, we will see that on the event horizon, we have exactly the same asymptotics, exactly the same asymptotics uh, on constant radius of the surface and exactly the same asymptotics on the of the radiation field. Okay, it's exactly the same, which means that the asymptotics are exactly the same independently of the charge as long as you know, the charge is sub-extremal. So it doesn't seem that the charge implicit, explicitly appears in the top order asymptotics. So if that's the case, then one could believe that, okay, um, we can um, allow the charge to reach its maximum value. And maybe we still get exactly the same asymptotics since these asymptotics are independent of the charge. Uh, so one could believe that exactly the same asymptotics hold for extremal resonance. But that's not true at all. And the reason it's not true is because the estimates depend on the charge. And the error terms depend on the charge. And in fact, the error terms blow up as the charge reaches, reaches its extremal value. Um, so what are the asymptotics in the extremal case? These are the asymptotics. Uh, along the event horizon, the decay rate is only t to the minus one. That's the sharp decay rate. Um, the coefficient now is something different. It's not that I think that conservation law we derived earlier, it's something different. So weaker decay rate and a different coefficient. A long constant, like, and this is much weaker, it's not even integrable. Um, a long constant radius hypersurfaces, we have slightly stronger decay rate, but still nothing close to the t to the minus three, which was the case in the sub extremal case. The coefficient here is the same as this one. And now for the radiation field, we have the same decay rate. Say for watts, we have t to the minus t. But the coefficient involves both the conserved quantity we introduced before, plus this new mysterious one, okay? That appears only in the extremal case. All right, so what I would like to present now is what this constant is. Well, not surprisingly, this constant also uh, is a result of the conservation law, as was this constant here, which again um, contributes to the belief that uh, you know precise asymptotics should be um, uh, governed by conservation laws. So indeed, this will think this thing will be uh, will be a conserved quantity. So let's see what conserved quantity it is. First of all. Um, the, the, one of the reasons why we have different asymptotics is due to the degeneracy of the redshift effect. So we don't have any more things um, tending, uh, shifting to the red. Okay, so the, the redshift effect generates along the event horizon in the extremal case. Uh, this geometrically implies that on the event horizon, we have a conservation law. And the, the value of the conservation law actually is precisely this H. 
Okay. So for like all previous black holes, we had the conservation law here. That was the limit of the conservation laws of Mikowski here. Now in the exactly extremal case, we have, we still have the conservation law here, which gives us this for the time integral of C. And we have a new conservation law here due to the generation of the right safety effect. So this conservation law is precisely this one here. It's the integral over sections of um, the event horizon, uh, where we take psi, we take the mass, and we take the transversal derivative of the scalar field. So if we integrate the transversal derivative of the scalar field plus psi, okay, over sections, then the result we get is independent of the section. Okay, we can get we can go to a future section, we still get the same result. So if initially was the value was one of that integral over that initial sphere here, then it will be one for all spheres. And that immediately tells you that you know these quantities here cannot decay because their integral has to be conserved for all future sections of the event horizon. Such a quantity definitely decays in the sub-extremal case. Okay. So as I just said, like generically for initial data, this quantity you know, can immediately be seen to be initially non-zero. So it will always stay non-zero since it's conserved along the event horizon. Now, what are the consequences of having such a conserved quantity? Well, the first one is a non-decay result, which I already basically mentioned, but we can refine its statement a little bit. Um, so for generic, uh, perturbations of the type that I mentioned before, we have that the transversal derivatives along the event horizon do not decay. And actually second order transversal derivatives along the event horizon blow up. And they blow up linearly. Uh, and the limits here, um, like the growth factors depend precisely on the value of the conserved quantity. Now that conserved quantity can be thought as a hair because we have piece of the piece of information of the scalar perturbation that uh, does not disappear in the evolution. It's conserved, so it stays there for all times. So that's why we call it here. But it stays there for all times only along the event horizon. It's conserved only along the horizon, and that's why you can call it horizon here. So that conserved charge, we can call it horizon here. Now that horizon here has some physical meaning in the sense that it's related to one of the components of the energy momentum tensor. Um, but nonetheless, you see all these things disappear away from the event horizon in the sense that all these quantities do decay, not super fast, but at least do decay along the, uh, away from the event horizon. It's only along here where things can grow. Um, there have been various uh, extensions of this horizon stability in various settings by various people. I would probably just want to mention an uh, upcoming work by one of my PhD students, Mario Petraia, who is basically generalizing this horizon stability, uh, which here is only stated for the linear wave equation, to the um, uh, linearized gravity around extremal as an Okay, following work of Elena. Um, all right, so we have a conserved charge at null infinity, and that conserved charge at null infinity becomes the boss of the asymptotics uh, along the event, uh, everywhere basically, okay? It contributes everywhere. So one um, um, conclusion that we can reach is that now it's not the weak field dynamics that determine the asymptotics, but it's actually the strong dynamics, the strong field dynamics here that determine the asymptotics of the perturbation everywhere. This H is determined by the perturbation at the event horizon, and it's responsible for the asymptotics everywhere. So, Can we measure the, this constant away from the horizon? Like, can we somehow see this horizon stability if we are away from it, away from the black hole? And the answer is yes. And it's yes, precisely because of what I just said. This constant appears in the asymptotics of the scalar perturbation everywhere. So in particular, even away from the black hole. 
Okay, so if we are away from the black hole, we can see the asymptotics and hence inversely thinking, we can find the constant. Okay, which uh, is conserved at the event horizon. So this gives us the first signature that I defined before. And uh, based on the asymptotics that I just presented, we have exactly this result. That this quantity here just immediately follows from the asymptotics. Um, it's zero in the sub-extremal case, and it's non-zero in the extremal case. So this allows us now to, but not only it's, um, oh, I don't know why I have it in, but not only in the extremal case, it's not zero, but this quantity here, like this signature here, is precisely equal to the horizon charge H. Okay, so based on the quantity that can be computed from null infinity, but over all angles, uh, we can compute the horizon constant H. So we can really compute from null infinity um, the horizon here. So we can observe from null infinity. So the, the horizon is instability of an extremely black hole. Anyway, the um, conclusions are that extremely black holes admit classical externally measurable hair. The horizon hair aids can could potentially serve as an observation signature precisely because this is equal to this quantity in the extremal case. And one could say that in the extremal case, information leaks from the event horizon to null infinity. But we have to be careful, right? Um, that uh, in no way I claim here that we um, violate any domain of dependence property or something like that. Okay, it's just that definitely a quantity that can be defined on null infinity can be computed from sorry can be defined uh, on the event horizon can be computed from null infinity. <clears throat> so, uh, Burko Kana and Samharval have uh, provided numerical simulations of this, which confirm precisely that this function here, this quantity here, is uh, going to zero. So, this limit here is going to zero in the extremal, in the sub extremal case, but um, is not going to zero. So, it's this blue thing, is not going to zero in the extremal case. And not only this, but they have been able to uh, measure what's going on in the near extremal black hole regime and um, quantitatively derive some conclusions about uh, the passage from uh, sub extremality to near extremality to exact extremality. Okay, so they have been they have been able to obtain a transient phenomenon of um, the existence of these observation signatures for near extremal black holes. Okay, mm, this is more or less everything I wanted to say about um, extremality and sub-extremality. Now, in the next uh, five or few minutes, I would like to just take um, this uh, discussion of um, asymptotics a step further. Uh, so I'm now slightly deviating from uh, the title of the lecture, which is uh, of the talk, which is uh, observation signature. And I'm just not only going to focus on asymptotics. And I would like to show you a few more asymptotics. So uh, for the Schwarzschild case, uh, these are the asymptotics that we have already seen. Now, we know what happens if we turn on the charge, but what happens if we turn on the angular momentum? Well, we get exactly the same things. Okay, so along the event horizon, eight minus eight, this thing, minus eight, this thing, and so on. So exactly the same asymptotics for the whole sub-extremal care family. Okay, so again, it's a carefully defined conservation law in the sub-extremal care case that again dominates the um, asymptotics. Um, and I need also to say, of course, that the uh, same asymptotics have been also obtained by Peter Hintz with a different approach. Now, our approach is based on purely physically space techniques. In fact, as I said, it's only the main, the, the, the crucial ingredient is those conservation laws that I showed you at the very beginning. 
And precisely because we're using this physical technique, we were allowed to extend the asymptotics to fixed frequencies of uh, the general perturbation. So care is not spherically symmetric. Nonetheless, we can take a general solution to the wave equation and restrict it to specific frequencies uh, relative to the boyan Lindquist spheres. Now, the thing is that since care is not spherically symmetric, these things will not satisfy the wave equation, but they will be coupled. Okay, they are coupled, they don't satisfy the wave equation, but still we want to study them as functions now on the care background. And we want to see if they decay faster than Psi itself. And indeed that's the case. Uh, so we are doing this only for L equal to one and two. Um, and what we get is the asymptotics in those cases. This is asymptotics um, along, the, along the, the radiation field. And these are the asymptotics in the bounded region, constant alpha hypersurfaces, including the event horizon. Okay, so that includes the horizon. And this for the L equal to one case, this is L equal to two case. So one observation here is that um, the decay rate in the L equal to two case is super slow. Price is low would say that this would be 12 plus three. So that would be two times two plus three, that would be seven, it's only five. So we can see here that it's already slower. Here the decay rate has been cut, sorry about this. Um, um, and the reason this is um, slower for L equal to two compared to the Schwarzschild case is that um, this frequency, the L equal to two frequency is coupled with the zero frequency which decays slower, right? And that's why we see that in the asymptotics of the L equal to two frequency uh, appears the constant that corresponds to the original conservation law that actually depends only on the zero frequency. And if you look at the um, asymptotics of the radiation field, then you will see the constant of the zero frequency and the constant of the zero of the two frequency, the conservation law corresponding to the two frequency, contributing both of them in the asymptotics of the radiation field for the two frequency. Okay, so you have coupling of the conservation laws in the asymptotics at the radiation field. And that's why we have slower decay. So even though the asymptotics, the general asymptotics from Schwarzschild to care are exactly the same, exactly the same. As soon as we try to find the asymptotics at higher angular frequencies, then that exactly same phenomenon completely collapses, okay? And uh, the asymptotics that you get in the care case for higher angular frequencies are different compared to the Svatsi case. Another thing I would like to say is that if you look at the L equal to one case and you just follow the asymptotics of that frequency along the null generators of the event horizon, then you get the T to the minus five decay rate, but moreover, you get the oscillations, okay? So these uh, horizon oscillations have also previously been um, um, observed by Barak and Ori. Um, I don't know if I have time to explain a few more details as to how the physical space techniques, um, what physical space techniques we use uh, to derive these results. Um, I'm not, I will not try to discuss these details. I just want to, to say that, okay, there is a standard hierarchy by Mihalis and Igor that uh, can be extended further. And that extension um, makes use precisely of the quantities that have that are conserved. So the conservation laws allow us to extend some hierarchies and uh, obtain more estimates, okay, which allow us to derive very fast decay for energy fluxes, which then coupled with various elliptic estimates and um, allow us to get the final decay rate. Okay, that's very roughly the idea. Um, I talked a lot about extremality, but I only mentioned the Rise and Austin family. What about the care family and its extremal limit? So extremal care. Things that are way more complicated. Um, uh, we have axisymmetry, right? So that means that um, axisymmetric solutions do exist. 
such solutions basically behave as general solutions in the Ryzen Nostrum case. So all the phenomena that I mentioned about extremal Ryzen Nostrum carry two axisymmetric solutions um, on the extremal curve. What about the non axisymmetric solutions, but uh, of fixed azimuthal frequency? Well, these solutions do also suffer from a horizon stability, but this is much stronger. Uh, this was first observed by Grala, Zimmerman, Casals, and there is upcoming rigorous work by Day and Geitz that um, completely characterizes that in instability. Now, what about the case where you consider the um, um, general solutions to the wave question without any bound on the frequency, that's completely open. So for general solutions to the wave question, the extremal care, we don't even know if basic boundless results hold. Uh, the results are so severe here that one could even think that one could use perturbations, uh, like smooth perturbations of extremal care to form naked singularities, okay, in, for the Einstein equations. One last slide. Um, I spend a lot of time trying to convince you that conservation laws uh, play a huge role in determining asymptotics, which themselves then play a role in understanding observational signatures. Um, for this reason, uh, I, in a previous work of mine, have tried to derive um, necessary and sufficient geometric conditions on all hypersurfaces uh, so that they admit conservation laws. So that's a theory that have been done, have been developed for the linear wave equation. A similar theory has recently been developed by myself, uh, Stefan, Stefan Cimek and Igor um, for um, perturbations of Mikovsky, but for the uh, fully nonlinear Einstein questions. Uh, and this is a theory that uh, Stefan talked uh, in his um, mini course a few weeks ago. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is that the charges, like the conserved quantities in that case, are related to fundamental physical quantities, such as the mass, linear angular momentum, center of mass, uh, in contrast to our case, which was related to all these um, instabilities and observational signatures. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh Thank you. Well, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Sergio has a hand. Yeah, do you, do you hear me? Because yeah, I, yes. I, yeah, okay. So uh, yeah, very nice talk and the results are very impressive. I, I, I just wonder, first of all, how much you can say if you make perturbations of the, uh, of the, results that you are talking about in other words if you protect the metric a little bit and in particular if you if you uh, really try to make conjectures let's say about what would happen for the the full Einstein equations in particular since the extremal case is supposed to be I mean presumably it's going to be unstable uh, is there anything that you can still talk about as a signature of what could happen in that case so thank you very much. And by the way, it's very nice to see you again. Um, same, mm, same here. <laughs> um, so everything I'll say is a conjecture. Uh, one of the, con actually one conjecture I already mentioned it here, it's um, for the extremal care case, uh, because the situation is so bad already for the linear wave question. Mm. Um, one would expect that one could use smooth perturbations of extremal care and those smooth initial data, which are very close to extremal care, could evolve into, um, uh, you know, in finite time, you could reach singularities. Uh, and these singularities could be, you know, concentrated on a future section of the event horizon. But they could really be like, or not of the event horizon, but could be on a sphere on what could have been the event horizon. Um, but that would be, you know, having smooth initial data leading in finite time to naked singularities. That would be really a strong um, application of the horizon stability of extremal care. Now, I strongly believe that the signatures that I mentioned do exist also for the Tukolsky equation, for example. So there are quantities that one can write down that do not um, see the charge or do not see the angular momentum. So one can define them for the full family, but depending on what its value is, uh, you can 
differentiate, like you can um, uh, differentiate between sub-extremality and extremality. Um, yeah. So, so pres presumably the same thing happens for Reisner Nordstrom, right? I mean, you would still expect to have uh, non-linear, serious non-linear instability, but. Right? Very nice, thank you. So for Eisen Nordstrom, actually, the situation is not that, that bad. So it's those two bits here that um, give us some more motivation in formulating this conjecture. For Eisen Nordstrom, um, we have this instability, but uh, it's not super strong. And that's why the conjecture there is that uh, indeed one can form uh, singularities um, by perturbing extremal as a Nordstrom, but these singularities only form asymptotically. So the one component or one a certain derivative of a certain component of the Riemann curvature will blow up asymptotically in time, not at a finite time. Mm -hmm. And why do I say that? Um, uh, I say that because there have been numerical simulations by Harvey Real and his collaborators. Uh, where they perturb extremal horizon Nordstrom in a, in a spherically symmetric setting, so Einstein, Maxwell, Scalati system, they've done this nonlinear perturbation numerically, and they see exactly this that you don't form finite time singularities, but you do form um, asymptotic singularities of uh, derivatives of the Riemann curvature. Mm -hmm. It's like something like uh, asymptotic weak null singularity. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, thank you. I had a quick question. Um, you mentioned there was work of your students that's uh, ongoing in linearized gravity. Yes. So do you expect, um, what I, I should ask, what do you expect uh, insofar as the signature story in that context? Yeah, that's uh, again, this is what I was saying to Sergio that it's still conjecture because this work is uh, deriving estimates, right? He derives um, a decay results, like even not even sub, weak decay results for the quantities that decay and um, conserve quantities for the things that are conserved and blow up estimates for the things that grow. Um, so in order to get into the business of the signatures, you need to find not even the sharp decay results, which we don't do yet, but you have to find precise asymptotics, precise late time asymptotics. Um, I personally believe that in those, like if you like in those, you know, in the, in the precise asymptotics, there is indeed a similar uh, signature that is hidden. Um, but uh, you know this is not part of this work, and much more work is needed for that. And it gets way more technical and more complicated in finding precise asymptotics for all these terms. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions for Stefanos? Well, if not, let's thank him again for.